All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the, uh, let's see, the 14th day of January in the year of our Lord, 2024. And it's a bit chilly here. This is 3.30 in the morning. Um, For this area of the country, this is cold. It is currently zero degrees Fahrenheit outside and windy, like 18 mile an hour wind. And uh, for the rest of the world, that is, what, minus 18 degrees Celsius or centigrade? It's cold. For around here, it's quite cold. Uh, for, for other places, it's like a balmy day. For Minot, North Dakota, it'd be like, mm, this is a nice day. I'll go wash my car. But you know, Yesterday, we had rain the day before yesterday. And uh, then yesterday, it got went down to about 20 degrees for a high. I think today it's supposed to get up to four. <laughs> and uh, doors are frozen shut. I had to. I've got some chickens I had to. They refused to come out of the uh, the coop. So I opened the, the little door to let the chickens out. One of the hens comes out about halfway. She looks around for about 10, 15 seconds, turns around, goes back in. <laughs> and not one of them have come out since. So I had to make a provision to, to get some uh, food and water inside. The, the coop is the actual enclosed building. It's part of a, a, a building that has a, a run area. So there's an area that is is uh, uh, screened in with uh, hardware cloth where they usually come out during the day. And then if the weather's decent and there's not all muddy outside, then I let them out into the garden. And that's a fairly large area, and they go out there and scratch around and tear things up to their heart's content. Uh, so, but it's like that was a thing yesterday, and today I I'm, I have to go out there later, too early, not to make sure the water's not frozen. The chickens, are, so that I don't have nine frozen chickens. I think they should be all right in there. Otherwise, I'll put a, a heat lamp in there. Supposed to be like this for several days. This is cold. It's not my not North Dakota. I've been where it's cold, but for this area, this is cold. I mean, I've experienced 40 below Fahrenheit, real 40 below. My not North Dakota, fairly frequent in the winter. All right, and strong winds. And went for a mile walk to get to the store in it. Oh, young guys are stupid, and so are old guys, but nevertheless. Uh, I woke up this morning, enough of that uh, chit-chat. I woke up this morning, and uh, I I was thinking there before I got out of bed, and I was thinking, this is Sunday, I'm thinking, I really don't want to go to Baptist Church this morning. And I, I keep ending up... Uh, there's things you look for. But it always comes down to the bottom line is the gospel. I mean that that is. I mean you can uh, you can look for uh, solid worship. You can look for sound doctrine mostly. You can, you can look for something centered on Christ. But if their gospel's not right, or if they add conditions uh, for church membership and stuff that are like, wait a minute. So I can't I can't worship say in this uh, conservative Lutheran, Lutheran church in town here, because even though I was raised as a Lutheran, because they have close communion. In other words, as, as far as now, historically, communion was apparently practiced every week at the churches, all the way back to the, to the beginning of the church. 
as far as we, we can tell from the script testimony of Scripture and subsequent writings, uh, in, like in the second century, you have Irenaeus, you, you have uh, uh, Justin Martyr talks about in his apology, one of his apologies, he talks about what the church actually practiced because the church was being accused of, of all kinds of nonsense, uh, being cannibals, being all kinds of things. Uh, well, the same thing happens today. I mean, <laughs> on the internet, they're accused of all kinds of lies all the time. And that's always been the case. Just nonsense. People that aren't really interested in knowing the truth anyway. Uh, so, uh, like Justin Martyr and others wrote apologies, and one of, one of the apologies, he explains what the church actually did when it gathered together. And in the second century, they, they gathered together, they would sing some hymns, they would, uh, somebody would read from the Bible for as long as he could, and then somebody else would come stand up and they would, he would interpret, uh, uh, explain the Bible, and then they would do the Lord's Supper, or they might baptize some people, uh, and then they would take, uh, take for those that were sick, they would take the, the bread and the wine, the consecrated bread and wine, to those those members who couldn't be there, too. That's what it was. That was basically all it was. Uh, it was very simple. They'd meet wherever they could. They didn't have buildings. Uh, the early uh, the church generally met in houses, and pr probably the more wealthy people houses because they were bigger. Uh, and that's that's what they did. They, they, nobody built a church building. It's like, why? In Jerusalem, before they were under persecution, they would meet often in the temple, and that wouldn't have been in the temple proper. It would have been in the, the colonnade. It would have been in the expanded area that, that Herod put down to the south uh, where it was like a a uh, general gathering place, an open area, well, open with with pillars and a not really roofed though, uh, but the, uh, the the it's like a plaza, you could say, on the southern end, and that and then up past that is probably a almost a hundred yards past that is where the temple itself would have been. So there would have been the the uh, the outer wall, and inside that there would have been the court of the women, and inside that there was the, the actual temple court where the sacrifices were done, and the men would go in there, um, and that's a priest. They would bring their offerings, and that would be a sacrifice there, and then the priesthood, only the... Uh, the priest could go in and minister inside the temple building proper, except for the Holy of Holies, and it was only the high priest and only one day a year. That's all been done away with. Yet when Christ died, that curtain in the temple, that if you want to call it a curtain, um, that separated the holiest, the holy place, the holiest of holies, from the main part of the temple structure, that had the part that had the the showbread and the, the lamp and all those other things that was part of daily worship. Uh, of course, ordinary people couldn't go in there. You had to be part of the priesthood. And th that curtain that separated God from everything else was ripped from top to bottom when Christ died on the cross. To symbolize what? That had the way was now open to God because God, Christ had atoned for the sins of the world. So we don't need to go through the offerings and all that stuff to come to him. We can simply come to him by faith. Everyone can come to God by faith if they believe in him, if they believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And I was thinking, who all actually presents the gospel the way Jesus and the apostles do? Without added conditions. I can think of all kinds of denominations that add all kinds of added conditions. Uh, but what does the Scripture say? What does the Scripture actually teach? So let's go here to, to Jesus himself. 
John chapter 3. Of course, Nicodemus came, comes to him, and first thing that Jesus says is, you must be born again. And that's a reference to the new covenant that was promised in the, in the prophets, especially in Jeremiah and uh, Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36. Other places too, but especially there in greatest detail. But here in John 3.36, we have here, here that he that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. He that believes in the Son has everlasting life. He that does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. what Christ says. Now here, um, one I, what I'd like to point out here is not, it's, it says the same thing in English, but not quite as strongly. In the original, it's, it's the uh, he that believes is he who is a, uh, who is believing, he who is a believer in the Son. It's not a one-time thing. It is somebody who believes in the Son. It's an ongoing state of believing. That you actually believe, you, you trust in Him. It's a relationship of trust. Has current tense everlasting life. It's not something you may have in the future. It's something you do have. John 3.16, because of, uh, let's go back there a little bit. Oh, but before I go there, he that does not believe, that's apithio, it means, it. I would say what it means is somebody that has heard the gospel and rejected it. it it's, it's really, uh, the way that that Greek word doesn't really mean that somebody that has not heard, somebody that's ignorant of the gospel, but somebody who has heard the message of salvation and rejected it. And that's why the anger of God abides in him. And corresponding to Romans chapter 1, too, where the wrath of God is revealed against those, not because those, those that don't have truth, but those that know truth and suppress it, who reject it. There's a difference. Not the, not, no one is, is ignorant of the existence of God, and that's what Romans chapter 1 is about. But here is a, specifically about Jesus Christ. He that believes in the Son has everlasting life or eternal life. He that doesn't, who, who, he who has, refuses to believe would be one way to put that, in him, who rejects him, the wrath of God abides on him. He shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. It's a very strong statement. Uh, John 3.16, there's a little difference here because John 3.16 has, uh, and people, this is, a, this is an English trap, by the way. Uh, well, actually, English is the same as the Greek, but if if you're not, you know, English-speaking people generally don't know much about English grammar because we don't study it that way. And we generally just pick it up and uh, don't look at the actual rules <laughs> normally or didn't pay attention in school. But it says here, uh, it says, in order... Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, the gave there, by the way, is a simple past tense. This is, so God's love toward to the world, to the cosmos, to creation, is his that love is completely finished in Jesus Christ. It is a a, a past event. When he sent the Son of the world, that was all of the Father's love toward creation in Christ. The fullness of his love and grace and mercy toward a sinful world, is in Jesus Christ and only in Jesus Christ. There's no other ways. It was a finished act of God when he sent him into the world. The Father. That's, that's it. 
here, here's my love right here in this package, called this Christmas gift that's called Jesus Christ. It's all in Christ. He's the one mediator between God and man. So, but it says here, who that uh, gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Should um, is a what do you call it? Subjunctive. Okay. In uh, lots of times, subjunctives are are like possibilities, but it doesn't mean that here. It's an artifact of the grammar, and it is in English too, because in English it says uh, should instead of will or has, present tense has, which is why I quoted uh, John three thirty six, where it says, he that believes in the Son has everlasting life, present tense. What's the difference? Well, there's a clause here. It's called a henna clause. In order that, a purpose clause. So there's the Greek word henna. And anytime you have a, 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 this kind of a clause, the verbs are always in the subjunctive. So it's like should, could, would, those kind of things. That, that, so it doesn't sound definite, but that you can't do that. Uh, with it. You can't infer from should that may have eternal life. Or may is a subjunctive, too. Uh, so that's, even though the, the Greek, it's a, that clause requires that kind of a, a word, it is, it's, you shouldn't take indefinite, make it indefinite, because that's just required by that kind of clause. Same in English. It says uh, you, you could translate may have, might have. Let's see, how do they translate it here? Uh, King James says should. New American Standard says should. ESV says should. New American Bible says might. Um, uh, Young's Literal says may. English works the same way. It's a subjunctive, but it's not. Uh, it doesn't imply it's indefinite because of it's in this kind of clause. You know, I'm, I'm trying to say is just because it says may or should doesn't mean it will not. And that's why I went to thir uh, 336 because it doesn't have that kind of a clause. So it says he that believes in the Son has everlasting life. That's present definite. That is definite. Uh, so, th so it's... I want to clear that possibility up because Satan will use things like that to put doubt in people. He always does that. It's a indicative present active. So you already definitely have it. If you, if you are believing in the Son, you have currently already definitely eternal life. So what, what, so, what, so what do you have to do to have eternal life? Believe in the Son. Be a believer in the Son. And you have already eternal life. If you believe Jesus Christ, if you believe the gospel. If you believe some other people, no, you don't. You may never have it. Let's go to another thing. Acts, chapter 16, verse 30. Now, this is uh, Paul and Silas are in jail. At, where were they in jail? Was this at, um, Philippi. I should have known that. I did know it. I just didn't remember it. Okay, so they get in trouble because everybody gets in a stir because they're preaching Jesus Christ. And uh, they're, they're locked up and with a bunch of other prisoners. 
And Paul and Silas are praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, verse 25. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. That would make a pretty good parable of the gospel, too. God opens the doors and unfastens your chains. It's what he does when he saves you. He actually sets you free from bondage to sin and death. And when the jailer was aroused out of sleep and seeing that the prison doors were opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Because he knew, <laughs> well, if all your prisoners escape and you're responsible for keeping them uh, locked up, uh, well... Uh, I would imagine killing yourself would be better than the other option. Supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Of course, they didn't believe in God then anyway. I mean, the, the, this guy would, would have been uh, not a believer in, in the God of, of the Scriptures. <clears throat> but Paul cried out in a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. And so how did Paul know what he's about to do? Why did God care? Because God go desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Calvinists, did you hear that? <laughs> There's another group that doesn't have a clear gospel. Well, it does have a clear gospel. It's just not the right one. It's not really good news at all. Yikes. And he called for the for lights and rushed in, trembling with fear, and fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he had brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I, be, I do to be saved? He must have been sort of listening, too, as this was going on, perhaps. What must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you shall be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him with all who were in the house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed, uh, the jailer did, and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. Now, Paul didn't say, you must be baptized. He said, you must, I uh, said, what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. Baptism in the New Testament is identifying yourself with Christ. It's becoming a follower of Christ. It's a confession of faith in Christ. It is a way to confess your faith in Christ, the traditional God-ordained way. It's not the only way to do it, but it is. Uh, baptism doesn't save you. Faith in Christ saves you. If you don't have faith in Christ in those days, you would not be baptized. And pretty much in America today, too. <laughs> So what must I do to be saved? Now, this is a particular event. Somebody can say, well, this is just this person in this circumstances. It's not a general teaching. All right, so we'll go to a general teaching. Just to cover the bases here, because there's lots of people out there that will say, now you can't be saved by faith alone. You must work, 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 work. People like John Piper which, unless he repents, he's not going to get to heaven, believe it or not. But if you confess, so this, what is, so the Apostle Paul, and he's, the whole Romans is really about salvation by grace through faith alone, as opposed to salvation by works. It's faith, not works, that saves us. He's very clear about that. That's his overarching message. So when you're looking, especially when you're looking at the writings of Paul, if you're getting some other message out of Paul, you're not reading what Paul says. The overarching theme of Paul, like the first 11 chapters of Romans, is we're saved by faith, not works. 
not works of law, not obedience. We're saved by trusting God, not by works of obedience. And no matter how insistent Paul was on that in all his epistles, somehow it seems like almost most of what calls itself the church gets it wrong. Or they repeat the words but don't practice it. Like the Nazarenes. There's usually a catch in there. So he's saying here, first of all, he starts out by talking about, uh, uh, but the righteousness, Moses writes, verse 5, Moses writes that uh, the man who practices the righteousness which is based on the law shall live by that righteousness. In other words, if you obey the commandments completely, always, you will be blessed by, by the law. Yeah, there's blessings. If you, dis if you disobey the commandments, you're cursed. How many commandments do you have to disobey? One. Because the law is a unit. So disobeying one word of the law, one commandment of the law is to break the law. It's a singular. It's not, a, not the laws of God. It's the law of God. All 613 commandments in the law, roughly. So if you break one of them, it's like you break the kosher rules or you break this or, or go get yourself tattooed or something like that, beep, you're done. Yeah, how many people want to reduce it to the 10? That was only the introduction to the law. That's not the entirety of the law. The entirety of the law is summed up in two commandments. It all hangs on two commandments. They're all applications of, of two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The same way you love yourself, as much as you love yourself. Do that completely all the time, and you'll live. But you've already broken those, haven't you? Probably this morning already. Do you really love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Everything in you. Including all your flesh. Yeah, that's why we need something else. Salvation by faith in Christ rather than salvation by the law. But the righteousness is, that is based on faith. So there's two kinds of righteousness. There's a righteousness that is earned through obedience to the commandments. Or obedience to God, you could say in general. But there's a righteousness that is based on faith, a righteousness that Jesus purchased for us on the cross, a righteousness that's given to us as a free gift. His righteousness, Christ's righteousness, because he kept the law perfectly. The righteousness based on faith speaks this, as contrary to, uh, to the righteousness based on the law, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down. In other words, I will, you know, it's, 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 it's something you do. I will ascend into heaven. Well, who said that? Satan. Or who will ascend into the abyss, that is to bring up Christ from the dead? Again, it's something that you would do. But it's, if he's being, as Paul, as Paul, as Paul, I think, is being uh, a bit facetious here in order to say this is ridiculous, isn't it? But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, or the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in, in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Literally, that is, into righteousness. Believes re into righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, into salvation. 
I don't even have to look at the Greek. I've done it so many times there. It's like, yeah, I know what it says there. Uh, so it's resulting is not an improper translation of that, by the way. It's just literally it's into, because you're, you're believing into Christ and you're confessing into Christ. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed, quoting from the Old Testament. Why do I have that on the screen? For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. For whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How can they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how, can, how shall they believe in him whom, of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good, glad tidings of good things. <clears throat> However, they did not all heed the glad tidings, for Isaiah says, John three thirty six, also, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ, or the word of God. Hearing by, because Christ sent his apostles or the, and the church into all the world to preach the gospel to all nations. So that's actually what it means here by hearing by the word of Christ or the word of God in, in some other text. Uh, the King James, I believe, says that and some others. Um, by the word of God. Christ commanded the church, the apostles in particular, to take the gospel into all the world. That's what it's talking about here the command of Christ to proclaim the gospel into all the world. It's not talking about hearing the Bible. That's, that's not what it means. Hearing the word of God. Uh, people get all kinds of ideas, and preachers will give you ideas like that, too. <laughs> Put ideas in your head that the Bible's not saying. All right, so what is the message? What must I do to be saved? Believe in the heart, in my heart that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. I truly believe it, in other words. And confess with my, my mouth Jesus as Lord, or the Lord Jesus. To identify myself with him. Now, historically, confessing Christ was always part of Christian baptism, believer's baptism. We, we don't see anything else in the Scripture. Other than that, I mean, you might be able to imply something from household baptist, baptism, but you can't prove it. It's only maybe. It's possible, but it's maybe. But still, even a child has to believe and confess eventually when they come of age. Because the Scripture does, Paul does talk about uh, a child being set apart to God, being holy in God's sight because of a believing parent. So there's, there's the idea of, of coming of age. Uh, in Jewish culture, Jesus went, uh, you know, the, uh, a, a child, when they became uh, um, entering adulthood at ages of 12 or 13, say, uh, uh, Jesus went up to the temple at the age of 12 to be for his bar mitzvah. He became a son of the commandments at that age. A girl, I think, was 13. So she became a, a, a bat mitzvah, was a, a daughter of the commandments. So she became responsible herself for obeying God and obeying the commandments. So there is, uh, but you have to, there is no secondhand Christianity beyond that. What I mean is you are accountable to God yourself for believing in Christ. Once you've reached an age where you can do that, you become responsible for your own acts. But what must you do? Believe in the Lord Jesus and confess him. You must identify yourself with him. You, you must... Commit yourself to him. Faith, 
true biblical faith is not simply an intellectual belief. It involves commitment. It invo it's a relationship. It's trusting in him. It's a relationship of trust, like marriages, which is why the Scripture talks in those terms also. The bride and the bridegroom. There's a relationship of trust. There is a covenant relationship. And uh, as in the case of a bride, it's the man that comes and offers to covenant with her. She doesn't go the other way. So yes, it salvation begins with God. It is the Holy Spirit grabs our attention and focuses on Christ, because otherwise we just go on about our business and, not, and be indifferent. But we still have to believe and confess, identify ourselves with him. And the, the normal way of doing that is, is baptism. Infant baptism doesn't accomplish that. That's why churches that practice that generally have something called com, uh, confirmation, which should be about the time you're 12 or 13. Unfortunately, you can't program salvation. It has to be a belief from the heart. It can't simply be a learned thing. You must truly believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and make a decision to commit yourself to him. To give yourself in his hands. As a sinner, that's frightening. I, I remember that is a frightening thing to do, but at some point you'll become desperate enough. So you're giving your turning your life over to someone you don't know. Uh and I was raised as a Christian, but I you know, the devil gives you all kinds of bad ideas. Okay. So back to the so so what what does the scripture say about salvation? And it says the same thing in Acts chapter two, by the way. Or what? Uh, he, he, Paul says, "Be bap." Uh, that there's a, there's an example where a false sect called the Churches of Christ really messed this up. Actually, it's not even there. Where is that? So here, <clears throat> I'm going to go over here. So this this is at Pentecost, and Peter begins preaching, and he's talking about, uh, quoting from Joel, uh, about this, the outpouring of the Spirit, uh, and people, uh, because they were speaking in tongues and prophesying, and they were, uh, there was a visible sign of flames of fire on the head of the apostles, and and here it says, he quotes from Joel, and then he says uh, in verse 21, and it shall be that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, this is exactly what the Apostle Paul says, too. And here's Peter grounding it in the prophet Joel. And, of course, Peter is, at this point, especially the chief apostle of Jesus Christ. He is the first one to proclaim the gospel. And he's the first one to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles also. Men of Israel, listen to these words that Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourself know. This man delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Yes, this was God's plan from the beginning. From uh, um, it depends on. I, I don't want to get into the certain problems here. It's not really a problem. It's just some people interpret it a certain way. That you nailed it. So as God had determined, this was how God was going to save the world. He was going to deliver up his only begotten son. The, 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 the lamb crucified from the foundation of the world. In other words, it's God's plan. As Peter says here, predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You nailed him to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Yet the Jews forced the Romans to crucify him. Exactly is what happened. 
Right? If you remember, Pilate didn't want to crucify him. He wanted to release him. But the Jewish leadership insisted, threatened Pilate, by the way. Yeah, we'll let Caesar know that you allow people calling themselves kings to run around in your kingdom. Yeah, they were threatening to, uh, to go tell Caesar what you've been doing here, Pilate. And Pilate was a weak man. He gave in. Now, he should have just maybe turned around. Of course, it was God's plan, so it was going to happen regardless. And the, the, the proper actors were in the par proper places, like Pilate and uh, Judas Iscariot. You know... Jesus chose Judas because Judas fit that role. He was a man who would betray him because that's what Judas was. God didn't make him do it. He just chose the guy that would play the role because that's who Judas was. You nailed you, he's talking to the audience here, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. And God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it is, was impossible for him to be held by its power. Then he goes on and he says, he gets down to the, to the end of his message there, and the his audience, the Jewish audience there said, uh, let me uh, go to verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, the one they crucified, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent, that is, metanoia, change your mind. Change your mind. Doesn't mean, how could this, this false, wicked notion that has been taught for millennia, that repentance means putting away your sins. How can you put away the sin of crucifying the Son of God? It's, oh, repent, repent change your attitude, change your mind. Literally what it means, metanoia. Meta is change in noia's mind. Repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They knew that this was the promise of the new covenant that was prophesied. That God would give us his Holy Spirit. That he would dwell in us. They knew all this stuff. Christians generally don't. So what did it, did it mean to be baptized? It meant to convert. It was why did John the Baptist was preaching a baptism of repentance, and they sent people down to ask him, remember, why are you baptizing? Are you the Christ? Are you the prophet? And he said, no. I'm a voice call, crying out in the wilderness. He, he was quoting scripture that they knew was that pointed to him as the forerunner, the advance man, if you will, for Jesus Christ to prepare the way for the Messiah to come, lest, lest God's, you know, lest the, the, to, uh, to prepare them to believe in him. Otherwise, bad things would happen. <sighs> For this promise is to you and to your children, your offspring, uh, for all, some use this for other things, but uh, for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. And with many other words, 
he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So why be baptized? Because that was to be identified with Christ. It was to confess Christ. It was a Jewish tradition that when a, a Gentile came to be a Jew, came to convert to, uh, to become a follower of, of the God of Israel, it wasn't a racial thing. So on, other people could come and join themselves to Israel, to God's covenant people also. How did they do that? First thing, if they were if they were a man, if they were male, they were uh, circumcised because the law required that. Secondly, they were all baptized. Baptism was used by the Jews in their traditions for all kinds of purposes. Ritual washing, uh, ritual immersion. It was used all the time, and it was done by immersion, by the way. Uh, it is still done in Jewish synagogues today by immersion. You walk, and at the temple, there was dozens or more uh, mikvaot, uh, baptismal pools, leading up to the temple. So what happened is, so you would ritually cleanse yourself before you went up to the temple many times. So you, you'd walk down these stairs into this pool of water, until the water covered the very top of your head. So you were totally submerged, and then you walk up the other side. That's, it was, that's what they did, and that's what happens in Jewish synagogues. But what it was, so people, people have argued, well, they couldn't have possibly baptized all these people. Yes, they could very easily. It was already facilities there for this thing. Very easy. Uh, talk about the ignorance of scholars. Totally ignorant. Uh, in fact, when I was in Jerusalem, I remember the tour guide, the Israeli tour guide, was talking about they found all these these uh, baptismal things. It was just part of Jewish culture, Jewish tradition. But when you were converted, you were males and females were baptized. It symbolized, and I've got the books around here that explain this. Uh, what was it? Uh, Moore's uh, book on Judaism in the time of Christ. It's a, what is it? Uh, technically, it's a three-volume set, but it's like in two books up there. But it talks about it. He talks about it in there. It was written early in the 20th century. Uh, professor, I think at Harvard. But for the Jewish tradition, baptism, it... Uh, for a convert symbolized the death, you're dying to your old way of life, you're dying to your old uh, family, you're dying to your, your old nation, and you're rising again to a new life as part of the people of God, as part of the covenant people of Yahweh. That's what it meant to him. It, it, was, it was to be, it was a, it, it was not a sacrament it did not have any power in it, but it was, it was a, a symbolic and a memorable event. A memorable, memorable event. It was like a, 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 nat a national naturalization uh, ceremony, where you become a, a citizen of the United States. It was an event like that where it was a defined act that was a way of pledging your allegiance. Uh, in to the United States, for example, or in this case, to the God of Israel. That's what baptism is. That's what baptism meant to the Jews. And it goes back to the law uh, re regarding cleansing of things that were brought in from outside the nation of Israel into it to purify things that were brought in. <clears throat> so... <laughs> When people today look at this, so often they say, well, Churches of Christ, let me point something out here, because they're terrible with this. To them, it means they, they read it, and this is the way they'll quote it, too. Repent and let each one of you be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. What do they leave out? They leave this out all the time. They leave that out. They said... Be baptized for the forgiveness for your sins. That's the gospel according to the churches of Christ. What's missing? 
in the name of Jesus Christ. Baptism is a commitment to Christ. It is faith in Christ. It is an act of faith. And not only that, let me show you something else. Maybe there's somebody from the Church of Christ out there that'll see this. Or maybe you've been heard their nonsense. Not the, not they're, they're not, not the only ones that do this. So the baptism forgives your sins. No. For the forgiveness of sins. Well, I've got too many translations on the screen, I say. Let's see, where is it? Okay. And it's here, be baptized. It's passive. You can't baptize yourself. Every one of you, upon the name of Jesus Christ, into the release or pardon of sin. Sins. So it is into Jesus Christ, upon the name of Jesus Christ, is by his authority and in his name, and we baptize the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The name, the singular name. He is, his name is the name above every name on earth. So some argue about should we baptize in the name of Jesus or should we baptize in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Well, what I do is I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit into Jesus Christ. So, so I got everybody's bases covered on that because that's what's really doing. You're being baptized into Christ. In, uh, uh, and it's done in the authority of God because God commands it. And it's into the forgiveness of sins. Ice is literally into Right there. It says, into the forgiveness of sins. So the does baptism forgive your sins, or is it being baptized into Christ? Forgiveness of sins is in Jesus Christ. He's the one who died on the cross. Baptism by itself does nothing at all. It is faith in Christ. That's why you're baptized, because you believe in him. You want to be identified with him. You want to confess him. And that's why there was always, historically, there's always been a confession of faith associated with baptism. It's not just a dunking somebody in water. That is the least important element of it. It is faith in Christ. Confessing Christ. And Paul, in chapter 10 of Romans, doesn't even mention baptism. Why? Because it's not the essential element. It's faith is the essential element. Faith in Christ. Faith that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, that he rose from the dead. Remember that uh, Jesus said to Peter, Upon this rock I shall build my church. What rock? Not Peter. I showed that the other day in the Greek. It doesn't mean Peter. It means the confession of Peter, that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, upon that rock, upon the rock of Christ himself, and confessing Christ. Christ builds his church. How these things have been distorted, how the devil loves to distort the truth. All right. Now that I've annoyed everybody with the Greek, it's important because people have the wrong, people have been told lies by Satan and they believe them and pass them on. So if I were to ask somebody that has any authority in the Roman Catholic Church, which is who? So if I asked the Pope, I would not get a straight answer because the Pope is not a Christian. 
He's a pagan. But, uh, in fact, I actually went over to Catholic Answers and looked on their website. Like, they don't have a straight answer. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? Do they have a straight answer? No. No. It starts with, oh, you got to be baptized. And if they were honest, they would say, you have to be part of the Catholic Church. However, that's not so clear since Vatican II. But traditionally, what did, what did the Catholic Church teach traditionally? And still does teach, at least to children. One, you have to be baptized. Two, you have to be part of the Roman Catholic Church because outside the church, and they mean themselves, there is no salvation. Vatican II muddy those waters a lot. Um, <laughs> muddied a lot of waters. Three, you have to uh, keep the Ten Commandments, and you have to keep the seven laws of the church. Uh, things like uh, going to Mass, confession at least once a year, yada, yada, yada. And obey the church, be in communion with the Pope. <laughs> How can you be a Christian and be in communion with Pope Francis? You can't. He's a pagan. He's a pagan. He doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, not the Christ of the Bible. He believes in some cosmic Christ. He doesn't believe it. You know, he worships idols, Pachamamas, pagan idols, Mother Earth. He's not a Christian. And a lot of Christian Catholic bishops and archbishops know it. They call him a usurper. They call him an antichrist. I mean, they're getting pretty vociferous about this now. But they're stuck. What do they do? Okay, so if but so you have uh, the basic Catholic doctrine, you know, what they used to teach children, probably still do. Okay, you have to be baptized and you have into the Catholic Church. And you have to keep the Ten Commandments, you have to keep the seven laws of the church, and you have to so these are all things you have to do. And you have to uh, uh do what the Catholic Church tells you to do. Believe the the creed, of course. Um, what else? Uh, go to communion, all these things. Yep, yeah, use the seven sacraments uh, to get grace. And so when you're baptized, you're you're considered to be born again. You're, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you have all these things. And you're perfect. So if you were baptized and then killed right then, you'd go to heaven. Uh die from something while you're in the being baptized, I suppose. But then after that, if you sin, you commit a mortal sin, you have to go to confession. What's a mortal sin? They don't define it. There's no definition of mortal sin other than a sin that makes you, that, that bankrupts you as far as God's grace, separates you from the grace of God. Uh that can be everything from not going to mass to committing murder. Uh, depends on who's claiming it. So then you have to go to the uh, the sacrament of reconciliation, confession, and then the priest will give you some penance, and you have to fulfill the penance. If you don't fulfill all the penance, then you have to pay for it in eternity, or not eternity, but purgatory. So if you're really if you're lucky, it comes down to this: if you're lucky and you die uh, with some grace in your bank account, if you're not in a state of mortal sin, if you're in a state of grace, uh, which means you're not guilty of unconfessed mortal sin, then you get to go to purgatory for, I don't know, 10,000, 100,000 years and um, work off your, your debt to God and get purified from your sins. And then after that, the being roasted for who knows how long, then you end up going to heaven and staring at God for eternity in the beatific vision. So that's the Catholic gospel. Somebody wants to correct that? Well, I'm go ahead. But that is about as much sense as I can make out of it. However, with Catholicism in general, if you take all the so if the Bible's authoritative and tradition's authoritative and the pope, uh, popes are infallible, of course, 
when Vatican I declared the popes infallible, they, uh, they retroactively declared all the previous popes infallible, too. So what do you have? You have this whole landfill, this whole mound of, of tradition that's all part of the gospel, the, the doctrines of the church, the one true church, the bark of Peter uh, that you have to be on if you're going to be saved, except Vatican II contradicts that. <laughs> so an infallible council contradicted everybody that thing before it, even though it says it affirms everything before it. And so you cannot make any kind of a rational system out of that. You cannot say, what must I do to be saved and get any kind of a sensible answer. What does it say? And the best hope most people would have is my father-in-law. His hope was to go to purgatory. I tried to explain to him, Jesus Christ paid for all your sins, but his faith was not in Jesus Christ. It was in the church. Can you be saved by faith in an institution, according to the scriptures? No. Your faith must be in Christ himself and what he did for you on the cross. That's it. If you don't believe that we're saved through faith in Jesus Christ, you don't believe the gospel. If you believe that water baptism remits our sins, you don't believe the gospel. You're believing something else. If you believe that we are saved because of the eternal decree of God, the Calvinist gospel, which is hardly gospel at all. Well, how does the Calvinist gospel go? What must I do to be saved? Calvinist, answer, nothing. Absolutely nothing. You can't do anything to be saved. Well, how is a person saved then? Well, God decided that before eternity. God decreed some people to be saved and some people to go to hell. That's the gospel. There's nothing you can do to change that. You're either going to hell because God decreed you to go to hell for his glory, or you're going to heaven because God decreed you to go to hell, heaven for his glory. You can do nothing. That's the gospel. <laughs> Is that the gospel? Is that what Jesus Christ said? No. He that believes in me has eternal life. It, uh, Calvin, it's more, I know it's more complicated than that. But essentially, it boils down to the good news of the eternal decree, uh, which is not good news at all. Not. It's only good news for the elect. The non-elect is bad news. There's nothing you can do. See, a Calvinist says, well, if you're not elect, there's not a thing you can do. Well, what if I believe in Jesus? There's not a thing you can do. There's nothing you can possibly do that will change God's decree. That's Calvinism. What kind of gospel is that? Is that good news for sinners? No, not at all. So how many elect are there? We don't know. It could be a handful. It could be everyone. Who knows? Who knows? Depends if you're Rob Bell or who knows what else. The Pope in a bad mood. <laughs> okay, so... Well, you know, the gospel according to Francis? What is that? Love the earth. Did, did you hear what the, the worst possible sin is now, according to, to Bergoglio, Bergoglio? Francis? Gluttony. That is the worst possible sin. Gluttony, because you're eating too much of the planet. Gluttony is the worst sin of all according to Francis. Really? And he, by what authority does he say that? By his own, because he's infallible. 
Yeah, I know it's more complicated than that too, but you can't you you Roman Catholicism their doctrine is such a mess you can't make heads or tails out of it. It says whatever you want it to say because there it is no system. It's not it is a mess. It is to, if you give tradition authority equal with the scripture, it becomes a dunghill. It becomes a huge mountainous landfill of trash. So where do you find the gospel in that? Well, you leave the mountain of landfill and you go to this book. And you have to go to the right spot in this book, too, where it talks about the gospel and how you're saved, like Romans chapter 10. But I suggest you read all of Romans, because that's what this is about. About it, the, the Romans chapter, uh, the book of Romans is specifically the theology of salvation. That we're saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ and not of works. It's not just in Romans either, Galatians, Ephesians, everywhere. It's not just Paul either. So when I ask Roman Catholics, what must I do to be saved? What's the answer? I want to know. Authoritative. What does the church say I must do to be saved? <laughs> yeah. Uh, authoritatively. What does the church say I must do to be saved? The Roman Catholic Church. Post Vatican II. With Francis as Pope. What do I have to do to be saved? I'm sure a lot of Catholics want to know. Calvinists are the simplest. Nothing. You can't do anything at all. It's not up to you at all. You get no choice. You get no say. It's not by faith. It's by decree. Now we know where they stand. Hopelessly. So just, just ask a, a Calvinist, so if, if somebody says that to you, tells you that there's that Calvinist, this answer, well, how do you know whether you're saved or not? How do you know that since Calvin said God deceives people and gives them false temporary faith, how do you know you don't have false temporary faith because God's wrath is abiding on you? He's just deceiving you into thinking you're saved, thinking you're elect. And they'll be able to say what? Nothing. Nothing. They have no answer for that. If you've got a deceptive God, you're you're a God that's willing to deceive you about salvation, like their God is. It's like, yikes, that's bad. Or God that creates people for the express purpose of throwing them into hell for his own pleasure, which they say in their confessions. In the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Second London Baptist Confession, that's exactly what it says. that God, for his glory and his pleasure, decreed some for damnation. They'll try to be slippery with the words, but you can't. Churches of Christ. Five things you must do. What does Paul say? Believe in the Lord Jesus and confess him with your mouth. Believe in your heart that Christ rose from the dead and confess Jesus Christ. And again, baptism is a normal way of doing that. But it's not essential because Paul doesn't even mention it there. It's a normal way. It's an established way. It's ordained by God. But it is not essential because Paul doesn't even mention it. Paul does not put an emphasis on baptism, by the way. You have to be careful, too. The word baptism uh, means all kinds of things and used in all kinds of ways. It, it can also, and they say, oh, it means immersion. Well, it means washing, too. It means dipping repeatedly. repeatedly. It's, it's used in a broad way. So uh, it doesn't have a particular Christian meaning, the word baptizo. No, it doesn't. But it is a normal way to confess Christ, to become, identify yourself publicly and, uh, and in front of the church so they know, too. It's, it's uh, 
typically a way of joining the church too and confessing before the church that you're committing yourself to Christ that you want to become you that you you are a believer in him and you want to join be identified with his people which is basically what it served with uh, in the Jewish tradition too a, a gentile becoming a Jewish uh, believer see we but because the church quickly became dominated by Gentiles, they didn't understand any of this stuff. So they read the New Testament, they don't see it. These are things you have to learn. Um, see, if we're not familiar with the culture. So the uh, the Churches of Christ, they've got five things you must do, typically, this is their standard. So first of all, you must hear the gospel. You must believe the gospel. Uh, you must repent of your sins. You must be baptized by immersion for the purpose of the remission of sins. It doesn't say they don't say anything about be baptized into Jesus. Baptism itself, being baptized in order to have your sins washed away. And fifth, live the Christian life. Let me point out one of the snags in a lot of these systems, like the Churches of Christ or the Roman Catholic system or the Nazarenes, Methodists, many others. Lutherans, I think, too. Uh, first of all, all sacramental churches don't point you to Christ. They point you to the church. The church is really the even even Protestant high high Protestant high church, so you have high church Anglicans, high church uh, Lutherans, who else? High church. What else is there? That's high church. Presbyterians are high church. Really, they're middle church. <laughs> So they're uh, sacramentalists that emphasize the sacraments. Uh, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, Lutheran Church, w Wisconsin Lutheran Church, um, Anglican, High Church Anglicans. Now, there, there, once upon a time, I don't know if there are any more, there were uh, evangelical, low church Anglicans were evangelical. There are evangelical Lutherans too, not, not what calls itself evangelical, but there are some Lutherans that are much more evangelical type than they are sacramental. In other words, it's, they much more emphasize faith in Christ as the means of salvation rather than, uh, than look to the sacraments. As a, as, so they, that's more focused on Christ rather than focused on the church. Sacramental Christianity is always church-centric because you have to have the church to give you the sacraments, which are the way to get God's grace. It's a form of bondage. It's a satanic scam that makes you dependent on an organization that calls itself the church rather than on Christ itself. It's You're, you're enslaved to the church. And that's how it's functioned throughout history as a slave master. Uh, because without the sacraments, there's no possibility of salvation for you. Because you sin. Say, uh, forgiveness of sins for many churches, including like Methodists, uh, Nazarenes, holiness in general, uh, Church of Christ, and many others, is, a, is only for past sins. It's like baptism, Catholic baptism. So you're you're forgiven all past sins. But if you sin after that, you're not forgiven. You have to do something else to be forgiven again. So it's Christ's death on the cross is not a once for all thing. It doesn't forgive you of all sins, past, present, and future. That's not what the Bible says. He that is a believer in me has eternal life. You don't lose eternal life when you sin, unless you it's a sin of rejecting Jesus Christ. As long as you're a believer in him, as long as you are in Christ, you are forgiven everything. You are right with God. 
That is the difference between real Christianity and this fake pseudo-Christianity that keeps you in bondage. So you you're, makes you dependent on the church and the priests and the bishops and the pope and keeps the money going. Because you can't be saved without them. And churches of Christ. So if, if so, say baptism washes your sins away. Well, what about tomorrow? Because I'll sin by then. If you go by what the law says, that you have to love Christ perfectly, love God perfectly, and love your neighbor perfectly, therefore you shall be perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, how long is it going to take before you sin and fall short of that? How long does it take before you fall short of the glory of God, as Paul said? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You're not the image of God. How long does it take you? So you're, you're, you're screwed. As I, I, there was a, I visited, a, now, now it's a, now it's this, it's a Assemblies of God church, but it was a church of Christ up the road up here a bit. And I, I remember I visited there a couple times and I was looking around, okay, what are these, what are these people are, are teaching here? And they had the Sunday school class before the service. And these, these people are emphatic about this too. If, like I remember, they, I went to one of their uh, uh, like district sort of media, area meetings, and they had a, a bunch of people from all over different churches there. And the preacher was up there, the local preacher was up there saying, "And, and we know that all these other people that aren't like that aren't part of us are going to hell." So the churches of Christ are really a lot like Roman Catholics hist historically have been. So if you're not part of the church, you're going to hell. So their baptism has to be for the specific purpose of remission of sins, the water baptism, the immersion. is That's what it does. And it basically has to be done by a Church of Christ preacher because it's not done for that particular reason. They don't even mention Jesus Christ. It's baptism into Christ and forgiveness of sins is in Christ, not in baptism. That is nonsense. What a stupid understanding. They don't. They leave Christ right out of the words. They don't even quote the, the scripture properly. Baptism for the remission of sins. It's not what it says. It says baptism into Christ, into the name of Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Into the forgiveness of sins because it's into Christ. Forgiveness is in Christ. <clears throat> They're dead, spiritually dead. There can be exceptions. Perhaps there's churches of Christ that believe the gospel. Where? I haven't seen any. I don't know of any. Maybe there are some out there. I, I know there's there's been a movement away from that stuff, I hear. But a lot of times, they've got one megachurch around here. And you can listen to some sermons, and it, sound, oh, it sounds pretty good, but when it comes down, they look in their statement of faith, yeah, you got to be baptized this particular way. And if you started to probe, you would find something other than what you may hear on the Sundays, typically, because they still hold to the same belief system. We're saved through faith in Christ. Paul's ex explicitly teaching about how you're saved in Romans chapter 10, that if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ was risen, has rose from the dead and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, or Jesus as Lord, you're identifying with him. You're not just confessing that he exists, you're identifying yourself with him. I am a, want to be a follower of Christ. I want to belong to Jesus Christ. I want to be one of his people. 
a disciple of Jesus Christ. If, if, if you're doing something else, it don't mean anything. Baptism is that. It's, a, it's identifying yourself with Christ, with his people, with him himself. And if it's for some other reason, other than that, it's not Christian baptism. So how many churches around are actually preaching the simple gospel that if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you confess him, you're saved? That he that is believing in me has now eternal life. Do they add something else? Well, then they're guilty of the sin of the Galatians, of preaching a different gospel. Does Pope Francis preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? No, he does not. He's anathema. Paul, the apostle Paul, anathematized him 2,000 years ago. He preaches a different gospel. Churches of Christ preach a different gospel. Nazarenes often preach a different gospel, a gospel of, of self-righteousness. And it can be very, you have to listen to it for a long time before you realize there's something wrong here. Something is not right. And I saw somebody complained about, oh, we believe this and believe, believe. yeah, I can, I can show you these things in here too. And then they turn around and do something else. It's like Roman Catholic doctrine. You can make it say whatever you want. You put the whole thing together and it says nothing. It's just a big pile of mud. It can't say anything clearly. Just like ask that question of, of the Pope. What must I do to be saved? And he'll be like, what salvation? What do you mean? We're all going to just fall into the great singularity. Go back to the Council of Trent, which... Vatican II affirms, by the way, and Vatican I affirms. At least they'll say, say something halfway understandable. What it is, faith plus works. Keep the Ten Commandments. Got to keep the Ten Commandments to be saved. Got to keep the, laws of the seven laws of the church to be saved. And then every time you sin, you got to go to confession. If it's a mortal sin... If it's not a mortal sin, well, don't worry about it. You'll just pay for it in, in uh, purgatory. See, to, to confess, a, to be a commit a mortal sin is to be outside Christ, to cut yourself off from Christ completely. Really, define it. They won't. Give me a list. They won't. They don't know. It's just bad. To be, uh, to be a non-Catholic is a mortal sin. Then... So all the all the Orthodox, and of course, in 1054, what happened? The the head of the the, the ambassador, the nuncio, or whatever from Rome, excommunicated the entire Orthodox world, and the Orthodox uh, nuncio or ambassador, whatever you want to call him, he excommunicated the entire Roman Catholic world. So all of you, both Orthodox and Catholics, you're all going to hell. And they, they wonder why Muslims don't come to Christ. Because that's what they see. They see the Orthodox. You go to Jerusalem today. Why don't Jews believe in the Messiah? Well, one of the reasons is they see the Orthodox and they see the Catholics. They turn on television and see Joel Osteen. <laughs> Ask Joel Osteen. What must they do to be saved? What's that? Does he preach Christ, Christ crucified, like the Apostle Paul? No. So, in spite of all their flaws and weaknesses, and there's a lot of weakness, the only ones today that will that are halfway consistent on what the gospel really is is like the fundamentalist Baptists 
and conservative evangelicals. If you ask them that question, what must I do to be saved, they will respond with the proper answer. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. They'll, they'll, they'll have their right answer. Or they'll elaborate with, with Romans chapter 10. Uh, if you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. Or for the fundamentalist Baptist, Jesus, the Lord Jesus, they, because they only use the King James, usually. It's the same thing. Now, they might not understand it very well, but at least you'll get an understandable answer. And it's Christ. It is not being a member of the church. It is Christ himself, belonging to Christ. They, do they understand that well? No. Do they understand the new covenant well? No. But they do understand you're saved by faith, even if they try to live by works. They're not sacramental. Sacramental is you're, you're a slave to the church. There's no, there's no way around that, because it is the church is the means of salvation, the only means of salvation, which is historically why the Roman Catholic Church said outside the church there is no salvation, because you had to have the seven sacraments, or at least one, two, uh, at least two or three of them. <laughs> Because there is no real salvation there. There is no definite salvation in Roman Catholicism or any sacramental church, including the Nazarenes. They use the word sacrament, too, by the way. Or Methodists. There is no, I believe in Jesus Christ, therefore I'm saved. They don't believe that. So when you sin, you have to repent, and they mean put away your sin, and, and confess and all these things, too. Although they typically don't, you know, they, they don't have um, a sacrament of confession or of reconciliation. But nevertheless, when you sin, you can be lost. So with, with uh, John Wesley, it's, it's uh, saved, lost, saved, lost, saved, lost, saved, lost. I'm not sure it's different with, with the, from that with Martin Luther either. It's not clear. Lutheran, Lutheranism is not clear on this. Christ is clear. That was, that was my own personal testimony, that this is what God spoke to me. What I knew, I, it wasn't really words. I suddenly knew this to be true, that Jesus Christ died for my sins. And because of that, I was right with God. He died for all my sins, past, present, and future. And because of that, I'm right with God, because of faith in him. I'm right with God. I have eternal life. That's what evangelicals historically have believed. Anybody that doesn't believe that is not an evangelical or a fundamentalist. They're not. Fundamentalists and evangelicals are sort of the same thing. Do they understand the gospel well? No, they don't. They do, do they understand, understand how to live as Christians well? No, they don't. They always want to mix other things in, like law. Yeah, we're saved by grace, but we live by law. They call it principles, but it's nonsense. It's nonsense. It, it, it doesn't cause them to be lost because they're not looking to their, their obedience as a way of salvation, but they're looking to Christ. But they cause themselves a whole lot of heartache by not understanding the promises of God. But I look everywhere else, including so-called evangelicals like, well, Nazarenes don't usually identify themselves as evangelicals either. Wesleyans, they're not saved. They're not permanently saved. They're saved until they sin again. Uh, the same as, uh, as Church of Christ. You're saved only as long as you don't sin. Really? That's what that teacher of the Church of Christ, they were teaching on that, and I, kind of guy I am, you know, I interrupted him. Visitor. So you mean to say... 
that if I if I sin and I that I'm I'm lost until I confess and repent. So I'm lost in between. Yeah. And then uh, what did I respond? Something like, uh, well, say I'm going down the interstate and I have a sinful thought and I get head on, uh, get hit head on by, say, a Mack truck. Am I going to hell? I didn't have a chance to repent. Splat. Gone. You're dead. You're finished. You're going to hell. Roman Catholic. Roman Catholic. So let you let's say you have a mortal sin. What's a mortal sin? Who knows? Who knows? They don't tell you. Let's say you didn't go to, for, for some, let's say you didn't go to mass. You decided you didn't feel like it. You just didn't feel like it. You're annoyed with the with the pastor or the priest there or something. You didn't go to mass. Some would say that's mortal sin. So and then let's say you have a stroke and you're dead. You're going to hell, right? Because you didn't go to confession. So you, you have a sin that's serious enough to separate you from the grace of God, which who knows what that is, not going to Mass, having a bad hair day, uh, uh, murdering 10,000 people. Who knows? What's a mortal sin? They want to keep you in bondage so they don't tell you. And you die without going to confession. What happens to you? Or you don't confess properly. What happens to you? Or if you committed a moral sin and you forgot about it, and you never confess it, what happens to you? For traditional Catholics, I'm not talking about Pope Francis. How can you sin against a papa, a pachamama? Oh, I know. Eat too much food. That does it. The worst possible sin now, the mortal, which means it has to, by definition, be a moral sin. It came out yesterday or the other day. It, it was in uh, Russia today. Uh, the Pope declares the worst, the most serious sin is gluttony. So all of a sudden, there's a lot of Catholics out there that probably have unconfessed sin. So if it's a, a mortal sin today, it's always been a mortal sin, even though it was never a mortal sin before. So you 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 had you ate too much for Thanksgiving. You ate too much turkey. Well, you did penance that night anyway, probably. <laughs> oh, I wish I hadn't eaten all that. Uh, by not being able to sleep well. So now gluttony is a mortal sin. Maybe the only mortal sin. The worst possible mortal sin. It's not genocide. See, the Pope thinks that gluttony is, more, is worse sin than what's going on in, in uh, Gaza now with the Israelis. Apparently. She said it's the worst possible sin, gluttony. So how many people are going to go to confession because they ate too much? Or maybe they habitually eat too much. You're all going to hell. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says if you're a believer in him, you have, present tense, already eternal life. And the only way to separate you from that is to cease to believe in him. To cease to trust in him. To reject him. To divorce him. It's not easy. Otherwise, when people got get old and their memory begins to go crazy and the wiring in their brain gets messed up, does God forget them? No, he doesn't.
He knows his own. Even when his own no longer can think clearly, he knows them. He has not forgotten them because they belong to him. He is a faithful God. Even when we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself, the Scripture says. We are not saved by the quality of our faith. We are saved by the quality of our Savior.